It is so good to see you all. Lots of familiar faces and some new ones too. Uh, we realize everyone is busy, so the fact that you are here with us today means so much. My name is Wendy Cooper, and I co-chair Empower with Nahala Zafaria. Empower is the women's initiative of Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston. Through this wonderful group, we empower ourselves, the community, and the next generation. Empower also supports the critical mission work of Interfaith Ministries. And today's program, Empowered Voices, Everyday Women, Real Stories, Real Solutions, we hope that you will learn, be inspired, and be encouraged to act. Our speakers today remind me of Maya Angelou, who said her mission in life was not merely to survive, but to thrive, and to do so with passion, compassion, humor, and style. Dr. Ann Barnes, Jondrea Clay, and Farah Zabai are passionate, compassionate, and stylish. They're not merely surviving, but thriving and they're helping others to thrive as well. Interfaith Ministries, Anne, Jondrea, and Farah share a common purpose to help people, especially the vulnerable, thrive and be their best selves. Now, before I pass it over to her to make a few comments, I want to thank my friend and co-chair Nahala for her tireless efforts to make our community a better place for all. I'd also like to remind everyone to meet yourselves during today's program. Nahala. Everyone, I'm Nahala Zakari, and I've been involved with Empower for over four years and with I am for many more years. Um, Wendy is right. I am is all about helping our community's most vulnerable people. And we are able to do this because of the support of our sponsors. I want to recognize our donors who have made this program possible today. The Esther Friedman Family Foundation with Ann and Ken Friedman, Debbie and Floyd Kearns, Karen Harbour with Compass Real Estate, Jane Wagner, Tina Chetta, Jessica Gonzalez, Barbara and Stephen Shepard, and the Be Connected team. Sponsorship and ticket sales from today's program help us do what we do best, serve over 5,000 homebound seniors and their pets daily, um, resettle refugees fleeing persecution from their um, persecution in their homelands, foster interfaith understanding, and engage people in volunteerism through Volunteer Houston. As you consider your, your philanthropic donations and where you want to help make a difference, please consider making a, a donation to help our work. You may make a donation at www.imgh slash donation slash interfaith, and we will drop the donation link in the chat box. Let me call on Susan Farb Morris to introduce our speakers. Susan, along with Sandy Friedman and Debbie Kearns are our co-chairs for today's event. Susan, Sandy, and Debbie deserve a lot of the credit for our program today. Thank you. Thanks, Nahala and Wendy. I am so very honored to support I Am and be a part of Empower. When I think of our three speakers, I think of Malala Yousafzai, who reminds us that when the whole world may be silent, even one voice becomes powerful. Our speakers use their voices to challenge health inequities, shed light on the intersection of race, culture, and identity, and to welcome the stranger. These are important societal issues for interfaith ministries, and for all of us. Dr. Ann Barnes is a physician leader, public health practitioner, entrepreneur, and innovator. A graduate of Harvard Medical School for her medical degree and UT Health Science Center for her master's of public health, public health education, and promotion. She currently serves as the chief health officer for Harris Health System in Greater Houston. Anne strives to create opportunities for all people to live their healthiest lives so they can achieve their full potential and positively change the world. Jondrea Clay is a senior copy editor at the Houston Chronicle. 
So she has an eye for detail and a great deal of curiosity. In addition, she manages and curates Who We Are, and that's H-O-U, We Are, a Houston Chronicle newsletter that spotlights the intersection of race, identity, and culture here in Houston, America's most diverse city. Her philosophy to storytelling favors the, uh, traveling the scenic route and exploring cultural isms, both in her own backyard and abroad. And Farah Musalati Sabai is president and co-founder of Afia, a food company uh, dedicated to making authentic Mediterranean cuisine more accessible to Americans and empowering women and children to pursue their best selves. So we welcome Anne, Chandrea, and Farah. We want to give you an uninterrupted five minutes each to tell us a little bit about yourselves, how you've come to be the women you are today, and doing the work you do to make the world a more hopeful, healthy, and just place. And I will call on you first. You have a deep commitment to health equity through innovations in health promotion, disease prevention, and upstream strategies to improve health. We'd like to know, how did you come to do this and why? Uh, well, thank you, Susan. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here with you and all those who sh uh, chose to share a little bit of their afternoon with us. Um, I was born in Fifth Ward uh, here in Houston and remember my second grade teacher, Sister Madalena Marie, asking all the students what we wanted to be when we grew up. Well, I had three answers. First, a cheerleader. Second, a cashier. And third, a doctor. Uh, and to make a long story short, I am not a cheerleader or a cashier. Um, I always imagined when I became a physician that I would take care of the people in my community. And I'm really honored that my career has allowed me to do that. I started at Baylor College of Medicine on the faculty and spent all of my clinical time in Harris Health System, uh, which is the safety net healthcare system uh, here in our city. Uh, sometimes when I would walk through the halls of Ben Taub, I would hear one of my elderly church members yell out my name and say, hey, Dr. Ann, is that you? Um, and it really made me feel like I had come home uh, to start my career. My specialty is in internal medicine and primary care. And as I started seeing patients in clinic, I recognized that they all came in with the same constellation of conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. Um, I would prescribe medicines. I would make recommendations about healthy lifestyles. Um, and then they would come back in three months and everything would be the same. So I had my own personal uh, eureka moment and really recognized that um, for people to live healthy lives, um, there was a lot to do outside of my clinical relationship with them and the prescriptions and recommendations that I made. Um, their health was largely determined by things in their everyday lives, um, in their communities. So I didn't have the terms health equity or social determinants of health in mind back then, but it was clear to me that there were a lot of factors um, that influenced their health and their uh, ability to make healthy lifestyle choices. So what that did for me is it compelled me uh, to get more involved in activities outside of the four walls of the clinic. Um, I wanted to pursue a greater understanding of public health, um, which is what prompted me to, uh, to get that degree and, and gain some skills in that area. And it also prompted me to get involved in community efforts uh, that address social determinants of health. Um, so that is a little bit about who I am and uh, my journey uh, to be involved in this work. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, next up is Jandrea. 
Chandrea, you manage Who We Are, uh, which examines the intersection of race, identity, and culture in Houston. And what our audience may not know yet is you are a co-founder of the city's first ever BIPOC book festival that's coming up in April. So how did you come to this? Tell us about the book festival and how you are where you are today. Hi, everyone. I'm honored to actually be here. And I want to thank the other panelists for joining me. Um, so I've been in journalism for 20 odd years. <laughs> and I came to Houston in 2012. And one thing about Houston, I mean, when you compare it to other cities in Texas, is just how diverse it is. You can go to HEB and hear five different languages in a you know 30 minute grocery trip. So that really inspired me to want to know more about the different communities here. And it was an idea, the newsletter was an idea that I workshopped for some time, but after the death of George Floyd, it really took off. Um, and it's really just, I see it as more of a love letter to Houston, but also putting a spotlight on a lot of the challenges here. I don't think there is a topic or an issue that you can talk about with, without also, in Houston without also examining some type of inequity. And that goes across education, healthcare, I mean, the arts. I mean, there are just so many factors of inequity that affect specifically our diverse and vulnerable, vulnerable communities. And so I really wanted to spotlight that, um, you know, Houston talks a lot about being diverse, but um, sometimes that engagement and that investment in these communities isn't done. Um, so I wanted to spotlight that and not just the challenges, but also talk about just the beauty and the joy and the culture and the cuisine that come from, you know, all of these different communities. So that, that was, I mean, it, it was one of my passion projects. It's, it's a love project. And so um, that's just really kind of been my mission. And with the, with the BIPOC Book Fest, it's kind of an expansion of that mission. Um, how it started was that a, a few of my partners, um, all of us are journalists and we worked for the Houston Chronicle. Um, we came into it as we talked about the Scholastic Book Fair and how we used to love it so much when we were coming up, but we also noticed that we would rarely see characters who looked like us or from authors who look like us. And so it really kind of sparked this, um, this drive and this mission to create a festival where we are amplifying voices of color. And we also, so there are two separate festivals. There's one for adults and there's gonna be one for children. And so we're really trying to promote reading through representation so that kids can see themselves. And you know the literacy rate is low in Houston as well. So we're addressing that challenge and you know, we're just really excited about it. That's fantastic. I'm excited. And um, do you want to tell us who your partners are on this? I am partnering with Brittany Brito. She, um, she was the higher education reporter and features reporter for the Houston Chronicle and also with Brooke Lewis. And she was a Fort Bend County reporter. And so, and both of them are doing their own things. Brooke is writing a book and Brittany is now with Eater. So she's an editor at Eater now. So, but we're all still in journalism and we're all still working to get this festival done. The first of its kind and it's, it's overwhelming but we're really excited about it. And the support that we've gotten from the community has just been overwhelming. It's but so that's <laughs> Congrats to you. We look forward to seeing the rollout on that. Thank um, thanks to Andrea. Uh, Farah, as Jody mentioned earlier, we read about you in Forbes magazine um, and knew we wanted to meet you. You were a refugee yourself and wanted your daughters and other women and children to know that while life can be very difficult, if you have a dream and if you persevere, you can create change for your life and others. Your dream was to found Afia, a Mediterranean food company that is quote unquote, a toast to oneself and one's well being helping to elevate refugees and families in need every step of the way. 
Farah, how is it that you came to do this and why? Thank you, Susan. Um, and I am truly honored to be sat amongst such inspirational uh, women on this panel. Um, and a bit like Anne, actually, uh, I, I, I didn't foresee myself uh, starting a CPG company when I was younger. I actually wanted to, um, to go either into law or, um, or be a doctor. So starting a CPG company was, was, was not where I saw my life going. Um, and my journey to starting Alfie is actually a really long one. And it, it really started with adversities that I had faced that, that changed the course of my life. Um, these adversities started when um, I survived an abusive relationship, um, when I lost two of my three daughters. My remaining daughter fell ill with a life-changing kidney disease. Um, and these adversities, you know, I was at rock bottom. And um, at the time, I made this decision to start a new chapter in my life. And um, I moved to Austin with my daughter um, when I married Yasin. And um, he also has three daughters. And when I first moved here, I spent a lot of my time volunteering to help with refugees that arrived here in Austin and they were really struggling. Um, at the same time, my mother-in-law was also going through her own struggle. Um, she too had to flee the war in Syria. Um, and when she arrived here in the States, she really struggled as well. Um, just like the refugees, she missed her life, she missed her friends and she missed home. Um, but she found comfort in our kitchen where she'd take out this black recipe book that's filled with generation old recipes and she would cook these delicious authentic meals. And I'd go to our local supermarkets to try and find some Mediterranean or Middle Eastern food and there was, there was just none. Um, I saw this gap in the market. I had my mother-in-law's amazing generation old recipes. I had a chance to prove to myself, my daughters and to women out there that no matter what comes your way, no matter the adversities that you are faced, you can start from the ground up and that you're stronger than you think. And it was an opportunity for me to hopefully start a company and be able to support these refugees that I was volunteering my time with and help lift the community and help people in the community. So I founded Afia and it all really started from adversities uh, a few years prior that, you know, sent me from all the way in England to the States here, seeing the challenges that the, adver that the refugees were being faced with and, and just wanting to make a difference and a, a gap in the market. Um, Farah, I think that uh, it would be helpful to say, is Syria your native country that you fled to go to England? Because you, your accent doesn't sound Syrian. <laughs> so um, so I, am, um, I am originally from Syria. I was born in the UK. Um, I did live in Syria for a few years um, in my later teens. Um, but born and bred in the UK, hence the accent. It's, uh, it stayed with me ever since I've moved here to Texas. Uh, <laughs> I do come up with a few words though. I, I, have, I have started saying y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I wanna uh, initially thank Anne, Jandrea and Farah. Your intelligence, your compassion, your passion and your beauty inside and out are quite evident. Thank you for sharing your individual stories with our group. Thank you. Thank you. And you are so right about our panelists. They are wonderful and we're honored to have you all. So thank you. And let's jump right into some questions for our panel discussion. So I'm going to ask you to keep your responses, please. It seems impossible, but to two minutes or less uh, for each of you. And I'll get started with Jandrea. So Jandrea, Interfaith Ministries unites people. Uh, in dialogue and in service and collaboration and uh, issues of race and culture and identity are often addressed in our vital conversations and dialogue programs at Interfaith Ministries. What is your guiding principle in choosing the topics that you tackle in who we are? And what are the factors that you look for to decide where your article can really make a difference? Thanks for asking that. So 
a lot of my topics I try to center around um, topics and stories that the Houston Chronicle is already writing about or that they're focused on challenges in current events and things of that nature. But for me, I think my biggest drive is to create dialogue. I think some, some issues can be very polarizing, but when you see a human face and when you understand the humanity behind it, sometimes we can meet and have a common ground. And I think that's very important with how I approach a lot of the topics is to find out how we can see eye to eye or just to, to uncover some layer that maybe you didn't think about. Maybe that's not a part of your community that you understood. Maybe that's another community that you don't know much about. And so usually I just kind of, I riff off of what the Houston Chronicle is, is doing, the work that they're trying to do in the communities, but just trying to bring it home and put a face to it or, or a name to it. And, you know, really just break down the di break it down to where there's more dialogue. I think dialogue is, is very important conversations, learning about each other. I think we we're living in a climate that has become more and more, you know, divisive. And I think sometimes we lose touch with that ability to be able to see and empathize and sympathize with someone else's situation. And I think that's what makes us more human. I think that's what I think that's what makes Houston better if you know if it's something that we can all do. So I, I usually try to focus on topics that will either teach a lesson. I, I do try to spotlight, um, mostly try to spotlight things that you just normally don't know to kind of learn your neighbor. That gives us a lot of insight into what's behind your, your column. And certainly with all the things that are polarizing right now, dialogue is what we all need. So thank you. Let me turn next to Anne. Anne, you were a guest speaker at one of Interfaith Ministries COVID-19 briefings for faith leaders that I am and the Greater Houston Partnership have co-hosted since, we think all the way back to March, 2020. You of all people know how COVID-19 has turned our world upside down and has given us all a hard look at the ugly reality that not everyone has access to health care in the same way. What do you want us to know about health care inequities and what is the most important thing that we as individuals can do to improve and build on the health in our community? In only two minutes. <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> well, we can start with two minutes and then maybe opportunities later, but thank you for the question, uh, Sandy. Uh, you know, COVID did, it, it highlighted all of the vulnerabilities of our healthcare system and health, health overall in our community. And so I want to just start off with making a distinction. Um, there are inequities in healthcare, but more importantly, there are inequities in the ability for every person in our community um, to achieve optimal health. Um, while important, health care accounts for about 20% of a person's health, and the rest is influenced by social, economic, and environmental factors, um, as well as the behaviors that we, we choose to engage in, like what we eat, whether we're physically active, and our ability to avoid um, toxins like alcohol or tobacco. Um, so the inequities that we see in healthcare and healthcare outcomes often um, start well before vulnerable populations even engage um, in the healthcare system. Um, now, having said that, um, healthcare does have a role to play in equity, in um, health equity. Um, so we know that um, access is not always equal across communities. Um, clinics may not be close by. Now in the world of virtual care, you may not have reliable internet service or devices that you could use uh, to engage in that kind of healthcare. Um, you also might see inequities in um, 
treatments and care plans. Uh, healthcare providers are human. We all come with our own biases, unconscious or conscious. Uh, and sometimes decisions on what to do might be made by someone just based on the person that they see in front of them, um, as opposed to standards of care. Uh, likewise, individuals who get their care in safety net systems uh, often have a limited um, schedule of benefits. So maybe not every therapy that would be available in a private setting is available in a safety net setting. So definitely that there are inequities um, in care and outside of care um, that we have to think about. Um, in terms of what people can do, certainly advocate for adequate funding of so, uh, safety net healthcare systems uh, and also public health entities. Uh, not funding public health well, we, we know, uh, doesn't do uh, any of us any good. Um, only about 2% of healthcare spending each year is on public health activities. So um, have to do better there. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is support um, any initiative that is gonna address social determinants of health, which again are foundational drivers of health disparities and health inequities. Uh, and that might be work related to ensuring there are high quality public schools in our community, um, that there's affordable housing for every, excuse me, everyone, uh, and that uh, individuals are able to obtain skills. Um, so that they can get a job and earn a living wage. Um, and then one very specific, specific thing that I have started doing personally, I believe that early childhood education can set a person on the road to uh, achievement um, and, and good life outcomes, including health. Uh, be the, the person at the baby shower who buys books and not just cute socks. Um, because reading is really a critical first step to um, the development of really vibrant individuals. So um, that's how I would answer that question. Well, thank you, Anne, uh, for that for that very broad ranging set of answers, but also very focused down into the individual and what we can do. So thank you for that. And yes, we'll have more time later. Um, Farah. Uh, let me ask you now, please, for the last, the past 30 years, uh, Interfaith Ministries has resettled thousands of refugees, as you know, from all over the world. And over the past settle, several months, we've resettled more than 700 Afghan allies and their families. You came to the States and you sought to help people understand the food from your culture. So could you say more about why? And what are the ways that you've seen familiarity with Middle Eastern foods actually create links across cultures? Thank you, Sandy. And um, I, I, first, I want to thank you know Interfaith for all the support and effort they um, you know they they put into helping these refugees because the refugees um, they need as much help as possible. It's it's difficult. Um, and facing the adversities that I did um, really made me empathize with a lot of the difficulties um, and obstacles that these refugees face, um, whether it's, you know, the loss of their children, whether it's starting from the ground up in a completely new country, completely new environment with new traditions. Um, all of these together are that they're, they're, they're difficult and refugees face these and their struggle actually starts before they even arrive at their final destination. It starts from the moment that they have to leave their home. Um, their journey to the States, if it is, their final destination is, is a really difficult one. And they're leaving a piece of themselves behind. They're leaving their lives, they're leaving their memories, their family to start fresh um, in a completely new environment with different cultures and traditions. But there was one thing that I, I saw at first hand with my mother-in-law, and I saw it with these refugees that would come here. One thing that they could actually bring with them is food. Um, food that reminds them of home, that smells of home, that gives them that comfort that home gives them, um, which makes food a universal language. Um, and it's through the food that they were making here when they came that they were able to create memories, new memories, that they were able to make new connections and find common grounds in their new environment. Um, so it's with food, it, it helped them. And that's why it was really important 
to me and um, to us at Alfia to create this authentic food. So it gives people a sense of belonging and a place in the grocery stores and in their new environment. Um, the food really speaks many languages and, and, and it, it, it helped them get through all their difficulties when they arrived here in the States. Thank you, Farah. I know just hearing you talk about food and the emotional resonance that it has with all of us, it makes me start thinking of all the foods that are important to me and what they say. So I'm sure that's that's true for everyone. Thank you. Um, let me ask each of you now uh, to say in just a few words uh, what you have learned so far from each other. Uh, Anne, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Um, it is really a pleasure to, to hear from these amazing women. Uh, so listening to Jandrea uh, talk about the upcoming book fair, I'm particularly excited about the focus on diverse authors uh, being offered. So my recommendation to buy books, we can send them to the book fair uh, to get those books. Um, but it just, it celebrates diversity and I think it helps to break down some of the walls um, and allows us to know thy neighbor. Um, and again, I think that's a, a critical part of equity and overcoming some biases that we, we all bring to the table because we don't know others well. And then from Farah, um, the, the phrase that I wrote down was entrepreneurial health. Um, I love taking ownership um, of, of your health in whatever way you can. Um, and what she describes in, in the work she's doing around food and culture just feels like, you know, she, she embraced uh, that piece of her health and healthy eating and, and now has this opportunity to share that with others. So uh, those are the things that I have learned. Thank you. All right. Andrea, how about you? So I've learned a lot. <laughs> um, I think one thing I learned from Anne specifically is just having a heart for the community. And what she spoke about with health inequities is so expansive and it, and it, it infiltrates so many parts of our lives. And, and that's just the basic. I mean, that's just your health. That's you know, how you live, your quality of life. And it just kind of goes from there. And I think, I really thought it was interesting that she said, I mean, she knew early on, I want to be a doctor. I mean, as well as a cheerleader <laughs> and a cashier, but just having that goal and seeing in the community that this is, this is a place that I can work and that I can, can focus a lot of my energy on and in. And I mean, I'm really just sticking with it and, you know, all of the work that you do within the community, especially within that health system is wonderful. So thank you. Um, with Farah, I think the word that comes to mind is resilience, but also just nurturing. I think when you mentioned food, food is it's kind of like music. It's, it's, it's something that it's a language, it's a universal language and bringing that to people who are in a vulnerable position, who are away from their families, their homes and bringing a taste of home is just so inspiring. And I think it does more than, not to say that you don't need other human necessities and basic, you know, basic necessities, but I think it does so much more for the soul and the spirit being, um, you know, when you're trying to start another life. So thank the both of you. Uh, thanks to the both of you for, for living and being and, <laughs> and doing the work that you do. Thank you, Jandrea. Afar, how about you? The first thing I want to say is from the two of these ladies is um, one thing that I can say is, you know, when you, um, you, you, you support and you hold each other's hands as, as females, everybody really benefits the whole community as a whole. Um, you know, and the importance of, of health. I think everybody has felt it over the past couple of years. We, we um, you know, we, we took advantage of, you know, um, how healthy we were all or how the importance of health. So really highlighting that um, it's, it, it's, 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 it's so important. And um, John Dre, it's obviously the multicultural aspect of Houston that you spoke of um, and, and just, you know, elevating everybody's voices and um, highlighting that, you know, everybody's from a different culture, everybody's from different backgrounds, but 
we are all one um, and it's it's beautiful um, and obviously everybody benefits from supporting all these these great women. Thank you, Farah. Let me point out that uh, everybody is invited to write into the chat box what they think they have learned and how they feel about it as they're listening to all our wonderful speakers. I know what I have learned. I've learned that when women are encouraged to nurture their gifts and embrace their strengths and ambitions, that we can change the world for the better. And we certainly see how you three are changing our communities for the better. So, Debbie? Yes, very inspiring morning. Thank you all. Um, Empower's mission is to empower ourselves, the community, and the next generation. Uh, and in many ways, the three of you are the epitome of our mission. Um, I'm going to ask you to answer these questions in two minutes. I know that's uh, been hard, but um, you've done a great job. Uh, start with you, Anne. Um, if you had the ability to add or enhance one topic for students in medical school, what would it be and why? And in light of today's healthcare inequalities, what should the next generation of medical students be learning? Yeah, so, you know, medical school is an interesting place. There are a thousand things and, and that bucket of what you need to learn is growing and growing. But I um, think that I would um, have medical students really learn about population health. So um, population health is intentional focus on optimizing the health of a particular group of people. And so, um, you know, we can think about our public health agency, they focus on our geography. Um, when you think about health systems or practitioners, you might think about uh, patient populations with certain characteristics, maybe a disease process like diabetes, or of a certain age, um, over 50, or a gender, um, women. Um, and so population health pushes you to think proactively about maintaining or reclaiming health for a group of people and not just on the reactive side of treating people um, when they're already sick and they've lost um, a lot of their quality of life. Um, I think the other thing population health would do for students is that it helps them think of the whole group and not just the single intervention, uh, single intervention individual that they're treating at the time. And I think that allows us to get creative and innovative about effective, scalable ways that we can help a lot of people at once. And then I think the other thing that um, this kind of focus would do is it would push medical schools to train providers on how to engage with resources outside of the healthcare setting uh, to improve the health of patients, um, because it really is a skill that you have to learn how you engage with social service agencies um, and collaboratives around the city around these important topics uh, that address social determinants of health. I hope. Um maybe you, University of Houston has you as a consultant for their new curriculum. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Farah, um, as a successful businesswoman, how are you using your experiences to help other women navigate entrepreneurship? How are you empowering young girls to overcome obstacles that they may be facing to be successful? So um, obviously, uh, going into entrepreneurship, it was uh, very different to what I expected. It's a journey. It, um, it, it is a process. Uh, it's difficult. It's very difficult, yet it's very rewarding. Um, but it makes it so much easier when you have support. And the support that I have had along the way cannot, it really can't be quantified, whether it's support from HEB, or Chobani, or even our customers like all around the country, um, this support really made a difference for us and it propelled and took Afia to, to new levels. Um, and I feel it's my responsibility to pay it forward and support other women and minorities. Um, it was important for me to show 
my daughters this um, and for them to be, you know, strong and for me to be a role model to them, to show them that, you know, when you have determination, um, you will get to where you need to get to. During this journey of, um, of, 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 of Afia, I think the, the one thing that I really like to highlight and I, I you know, it, it helps like other women is just to reassure them that mistakes are made. Um, I have made mistakes um, as I was growing the company. I still do make mistakes. And I think um, as women, sometimes we beat ourselves up quite a bit when we do make mistakes and we try to avoid them. But in essence and in reality, the mistakes that I have made along the way were actually my biggest lessons. And it's reassuring women out there that, you know, are starting a business that don't try to avoid them as much as possible, the mistakes, but don't be scared of them. Learn from them. They're your biggest lessons. So it's empowering them to be okay with their mistakes and um, and, and just make sure that they're learning from them. And I think that is one of the the, the biggest um, the, the biggest pushes I would I would tell any entrepreneur is learn from your mistakes and be fine with them. Great, great lesson. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, we think perfect is is the only way. So that's a good one. Thank you, Jandrea. Um, your newsletter touches on important topics and sensitive topics. Um, at times, we all struggle with preaching beyond the choir um, in our work, in our conversations, in our programs. How do you move past the choir and reach new audiences who may not seek out uh, stories about race and identity and culture? Um, I do think, I think, first of all, thanks for that question. Um, I do think sometimes it is more difficult because we tend to, we tend to become more siloed. Our um, culture has become more siloed as far as everyone kind of sticking to themselves. And even as global as we are, we still have, have tended to try to get information and um, news that is very, you know, culturally siloed in some way in some way. I think if I can present stories that create a common ground, that show that we are all pursuing life, liberty, happiness, that, you know, that there's a commonality amongst all of us, regardless of what the story is or what the background is, I think that can sometimes reach beyond just the, you know, the basic stories of, you know, race, identity, and culture, because they're all, you know, human stories. Um, I had an uncle tell me once that, you know, the planet is, is a house, and we may all be in separate rooms, but if a fire breaks out in one of the rooms, you don't just sit there and wait, it's going to burn down the house, you have to help put it out. And so I think on some level, just creating these universal narratives that people can understand that can, you know, so that it doesn't become that someone is an other or they're different. You start finding that common ground and that commonality that can bring you together, or, or even just to help you understand something beyond what your you know, everyday routine understanding is. So at least that's the goal, that's the hope. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's a start. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you all of you very much. Um, I'm a grandmother to five. And I'm grateful to all of you for trying to make this world a better place. So, Sandy. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Um, now we're going to ramp up the challenge a little bit because I'm going to ask each of our panelists a few more questions. And this time I'd like to ask you to answer in one minute. So, I know you're up for this, right? All right. So uh, first question, and uh, let's go to Farah. The first, first question I'm going to ask for each of you to answer is when obstacles seem really insurmountable, what thought or goal keeps you going? Uh, look for the silver lining. Um, I would say one of my favorite sayings comes to mind, and that saying is, difficult roads lead to beautiful destinations. Difficult roads they're not always bad. Um, and when you're facing these obstacles, um, or when I'm facing these obstacles, I always look for the good in that obstacle. I focus on it and I build on it. 
Very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, Anne, how about you? Uh, uh, obstacles that seem insurmountable. What keeps you going? You know, I, I think in my early life, um, you know, the goal was always change the world, which is a heavy lift. Um, but as I've gotten older, and I think hopefully a little bit wiser, uh, my perspective is if I can move us a little bit closer um, to the goal, then my piece in this huge puzzle um, of, of life and history, um, my piece has been impactful and effective. Um, so again, get creative about getting around or through that obstacle and recognize that even a small step toward the goal is an important one and it sets a foundation for uh, the next generation of incredible women to, to take it even further. Okay, thank you, Anne. Chandrea? I have, to <laughs> I have to piggyback off of Anne. Um, growing up, I, I still think I want to change the world, but I think making, making those obstacles more manageable, um, not trying to take on the world's problems, but the finding the small places that you can make a difference. I found that that helps me when, when there are challenges or even when I'm facing a challenge at, you know, at work, trying to get a, a story covered or trying to get some more information about a story, just tackle what I can and, you know, take it bit by bit. And then at some point you'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll have a more holistic, um, goal and that more holistic uh, mission as far as um, overcoming. Y'all each have such great, practical, helpful approaches that is really wonderful to hear. So I have another question for you. It's another one minute question. And I'll ask each of you. Um, and I'll start with Clara again. How's that? We're all facing unprecedented challenges, mental health challenges, abound for all of us, for our families, our children, our colleagues, our friend, our community. What is it that you look to that gives you hope? Um, simply put, it's people. Um, it's the fact that I'm sat here amongst a panel of inspirational ladies and within an audience of you know aspiring people, all working towards the same goal, to hold hands, to help and better the world that we live in. Um, and that can be through our voices, our actions, our empathy and, and, and compassion as well. And um, we actually have a saying in Arabic. Uh, the saying is, is a khiliyat khirbit, which basically means if goodness is missing, destruction prevails. And put into context of this question is, you know, it's only when and if we as humans stop caring, will we lose hope. So it's the people that we're amongst that, that give me give me and give everybody hope, I, I believe. That's a powerful saying. Uh, thank you, Clara, for sharing that. Uh, Anne, what about you? What gives you hope? Um, I would um, echo what Farah uh, said. I have had the wonderful privilege of working with people who are doing great work, not for fame or money, but because they care about other people. Um, and they give me hope um, because their heart is really pure. And then the other thing personally is my faith. Um, I, you know, feeling like there is um, someone with a lot more wisdom and talent than I um, uh, having an effect on on, on our world um, and some power over the struggles that we're facing uh, gives me hope that there is a future that is brighter than maybe where we feel we are right now, especially with COVID and, and with so much loss and stress. And so um, people and then my, my own personal faith keep me hopeful. I, I know that speaks to a lot of people, Anne. Thank you. And Jandrea, what about you? What gives you hope? I think, well, first of all, I think Anne and, and Farah have said it beautifully. And I think all of us have said that, you know, it's the people around us. It's, it's, it's panels like this and inspiring people that, that 
are just in the in the everyday community. I think, you know, this is just a small dent in all of the inspiration and all of the work that's going on in Houston and Texas and the in the world. And I think for me, that's that gives me hope. I think the future, the generation that's coming up gives me hope. I think they are a lot more active. I think they are conscientious. I think they try and they're learning from us. <laughs> so I'm hoping that, you know, that continues. So, you know, there's, there's hope there. I think sometimes it's hard to see. And I think also for working in the news industry, we see a lot of the bad, but there's hope. We all hope that there's there's hope for everybody here. Yes, thank you. You know, obviously we could ask all of you so many more questions and we will get the chance when we go into our breakout sessions, which we're not ready to do yet. But when we go into our breakout sessions, we'll, we'll all get chances to ask more questions. But first, I do have one more question that I'll ask each of you, all right? It's the same question for each of you, Farah. Uh, what is one thing that you want this group to know that we didn't ask you about your work and the ways you're empowering refugees and helping women and young girls? Um, so when I founded Afia, yeah, I, I really wanted to create a, um, a food company that could make a difference. And I really believe that through Afia, yeah, um, I would be able to support the community and the refugees in the same way that, you know, that they supported us. And, our first ever employee was actually um, a refugee uh, and he'd moved here to the States. He had two kids that um, um, he had to support and he did not speak a word of English. Um, he didn't know how to navigate the system. The smallest things that he could do at home um, in his home country, like you know, pay a bill, make a doctor's appointment, set the kids up in school, clueless as to how to do it here. So not only were we able to you know, provide him with that financial support, but we helped him and we taught him how to you know, how to address all of these things and navigate the system. And that really instilled in us um, and in our DNA, the importance um, and the effect of help and support. Um, so we, we, we do that with it, our, a lot of our refugees here at the company. Um, another refugee here um, introduced us to two families that have come, refugee families, and they're wanting um, to, um, they're wanting to go into the CPG world and, 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 and start their own little company, selling some food and, um, I volunteer my time and I mentor them and I, you know, I help them, um, you know, through, through my experience with Afia, um, you know, hopefully start them on the right path. Um, so it's just giving my time and mentoring uh, refugees as well. And obviously because of the support of the community, we were able to donate um, 70,000 falafels to local food pantries last year. And um, to everybody here um, uh, in the audience, um, I will drop my email in the chat. Um, if any of you are starting um, or wanting to start a CPG business and have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out. You know, helping and supporting and mentoring is, 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 is something that is, is dear to my heart. That's, that's a generous offer. Thank you, Farah, and that's amazing work. Uh, and uh, same basic question for you. What is one thing you want this group to know that we didn't ask you about effective ways to reduce health care inequities and why is this important? So um, I'm actually going to focus my response on the why this is important. And um, I want to share a story with you. And really the focus of the, of the story is about um, human potential um, and, and what we gain as a society when people are actually able to live their full potential. Um, so I had a patient um, who had an illness when she was a young uh, child. Uh, it didn't get treated because she didn't have access to care. And the disease progressed, progressed until she was really burdened, um, had a poor quality of life, spent most of her time going to doctor's appointments because a preventable or treatable illness wasn't taken care of um, early in her care. Uh, while I had the honor of caring for her, one day she brought something very special to me. It was a kind of beat up old folder like we used to all have in grade school. And inside were pages of typewritten um, poems that she had written. 
she told me that she had always loved poetry, had submitted poems to a national competition and had actually won first place. Um, she never got to go to the award ceremony. Uh, she didn't have the funds to do that. Um, and then writing poetry really kind of fell off the radar because again, she was spending most of her life just trying to navigate her end stage illness. And so when I think about why we need to address health inequities and healthcare inequities, it's because when we do, we really unleash innovation and creativity in people when they're able to live their best lives. Um, and I regularly ask myself the question, what would the world be like if everybody was living at the top of their game? Uh, imagine the problems that we could solve um, if everybody in our community had the opportunity, a fair and just opportunity um, to be vibrant um, and healthy. Pam, that's a very moving story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Jandrea, same question. What's one thing you want this group to know that we didn't ask you uh, about the intersection of race and culture and identity? So I think I'm also gonna kind of flip that question. And I actually want to know, I'm, I'm actually gonna do just like a call out to the community. I want to know your stories. Um, I don't know how that works as far as um, availability to contact me, but I think with the newsletter, I, I do try to explore and highlight a lot of stories, but it's also from my perspective. And I don't feel like I can fully do my mission if I don't have the voices and the stories of people in the community. So I think I'm just going to spin that around and say, you know, what am I I guess I want to say, what, what can I get from, what stories can I get from all of you who are listening, who are tuned in, just, you know, wanting to expand the narrative in Houston and, and really tell all of the stories that are there and, and all, just really be representative of this city. So. <laughs> okay, Chandrea, you asked what you want to put your contact information in the uh, exactly somebody's just asking, please put it into the chat. You asked for it. And so you're probably going to get it now everybody uh, Chandrea is calling us out and uh, asking for our stories and our input so she's given to us let's let's give this back to her. And that's that's a great call to arms, call to action. Thank you, Jandrea. And thank you to all of our panelists for having such wonderful, thoughtful answers and sharing so much with us. And I will turn the floor over now to Nahal. Thank you so much, Susan, Debbie, and Sandy for leading such an amazing panel discussion today. Um, it was an honor to hear from all our amazing speakers. Um, and Andrea and Farah, your, your stories are inspiring. Uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed today's conversation with Ange, Andrea, and Farah as much as I have. Uh, we said at the beginning that we hope you would learn, be inspired, and be encouraged to act. So we do have a few actions for you today. Uh, we want to encourage everyone to support the efforts of the amazing women that have spoken here today. Uh, so you can sign up for the Who We Are newsletter by visiting HoustonChronicle.com. You can go to your local grocery store, including Whole Foods and HEB, to purchase Athea Foods. And you can read more about healthcare inequities and then sign up to volunteer or donate to the Harris Health System at HarrisHealth.org. I also want to encourage you to register as a volunteer with Volunteer Houston, a program of interfaith ministries. Once you register, you can browse the portal for hundreds of volunteer opportunities that match your interests, availability, location, and passions, and then go out and volunteer. Lastly, I'd like to encourage everyone to donate to Interfaith Ministries. You can find the donation link in the chat box and we'll send it to you in a follow-up note. Once again, we just wanna thank you so much for being with us today. As we close our program, please enjoy a performance by the International Voices Houston, one of our musical partners and empowers Unity Concert in 2021. 
Be on the lookout for more information in the coming months about Empower's 2022 Unity Concert in June, along with other ways to engage with Empower and IM. Thank you again.